It's been over 20 years since one of the greatest games of all time was released. An amazing legacy that was built off envy, off betrayal, and what might never be. It's these shadows that have brought on the doubt, to which we must finally ask the question. To figure it out, we need to go back to the beginning. Back in 1985, Square wasn't the juggernaut it is today. In fact, it was the games division of a power line company called Denusha, and at the time had no desire to even develop an RPG. As back then, interest in the genre just wasn't big enough. Despite their part-time employee and university student Hironobu Sakaguchi pleading with them to make one. That is, until Dragon Quest came out. Inspired by American RPG series like Wizardry and Ultima, and with help from the Shonen Jump manga, the original Dragon Quest published by Enix sold well over 1.5 million copies after its release in May 1986. Four months later, Square had gone independent from its power line construction behemoths and appointed the now full-time Sakaguchi as Director of Planning and Development, and began work on fighting fantasy. Yes, believe it or not, this was going to be the original title. Sakaguchi wanted a title that he could easily be shortened to FF. But with Square's dire financial situation at the time and Sakaguchi's determination to quit the industry and go back to uni if it flopped, decided to release it as Final Fantasy. Released in 1987, the Japanese Famicom release would sell around 600,000 copies. And while critics panned the simple visuals and pacing, the game was praised for its story, which some even say surpassed what Dragon Quest had delivered 18 months earlier. However, two months after the release of Final Fantasy, their rivals at Enix would release Dragon Quest III, which at the time would be one of the most successful games in the series, selling near 4 million copies. While Final Fantasy became more and more popular with every installment, they were never able to beat Dragon Quest, whose success had become so massive there was even a rumour the Japanese government ruled that new instalments could only be released on weekends or holidays in fear of economic damage by everyone staying at home and playing the new one. Funny, but not true. What was true is that both of these series were becoming major hits in Japan. In the US though, not as much. It may be the most addictive toy in history, and it's definitely the hottest thing this Christmas. Nintendo video games. So to please the kids, they line up at the few stores that have been able to get copies of the hottest Nintendo games. These people are upset because even after waiting all night, they were unable to get their kids a new version of a game called Dragon Quest. In the U.S., it's mostly Mario that they want. Howdy, y'all. By 1990, Mario Mania had swept all across this USA. The NES had become such a major success, selling nearly 30 million units with an almost 90% market share. <laughs> Capitalism at its finest. Oh my god, this is bloody vile. And you guys think Foster's is bad. Okay, look, anyway, like I was saying, the NES had become a huge huge success with consumers, going up everything from Mario to Mega Man and every genre in between, with one major exception, the RPG. Prepare thyself well, Dragon Warrior. Thy most challenging quest ever awaits. Go with speed and go with patience. Seek out an arsenal and so begins a new epic, Dragon Warrior. 
Nintendo, now you're playing with power. Following the success of Dragon Quest in Japan, Nintendo sought to localize it for the NES, releasing it as Dragon Warrior due to a trademark with Dungeons and & Dragons. And due to its success in Japan, they manufactured a crap ton, well over a million cartridges. Which is just that more depressing when it didn't sell. By the time Dragon Warrior arrived in the US in August 1989, Dragon Quest IV was months away from release over in Japan. And despite fixing the mechanics, updating the graphics and adding in a battery backup, Nintendo American spokesman Howard Phillips was on record calling it subpar and pushed several years too late on a red AMA recently. That didn't still change the fact they had a ton of cartridges left to move, so much like with Shonen Jump in Japan, Nintendo used its own magazine, Nintendo Power, to move the game, offering a free copy of Dragon Warrior with every new subscription. This proved to be a major success, as well with over half a million new subscriptions, many more renewed theirs just to get the game. Nintendo Power would also push hard with strategy guides and future issues. In the end, Dragon Warrior would ship 1.5 million copies. Why do I bring all this up though? Well, this would lead the way for Final Fantasy's localization in 1990, Nintendo using the same marketing approach of its magazine. I'll be without a free game this time. The original Final Fantasy would end up selling around 700,000 units in the US, which was actually 100k more than it sold in Japan. So, work got started on localizing the second Final Fantasy for the United States. They even promoted it in trade magazines and a working prototype. However, by then it was the late 1990 and the Super Famicom had just been released in Japan. So, Square decided to scrap work on FF2 and move right to localizing the brand new Final Fantasy for the Super Nintendo, which at the time was Final Fantasy 4. Only problem was you couldn't exactly call it 4 when you haven't released 2 or 3. So Square decided to release it in the US as Final Fantasy 2. Back then it wasn't really an internet or anything that really connected the US and Japan's gaming community, outside of the odd magazine and importer. So American consumers wouldn't be much wiser, and despite only moving a fifth of the sales in Japan, Square were determined to keep localizing games to the United States. Sadly, Final Fantasy V wouldn't be one of those games, and there wasn't just one attempt to localize it, there was four. Square abandoned the original localization due to the game's difficulty and tone seeing a major departure from the rest of the series. Then came plans to release it later as Final Fantasy EXTREME! But that didn't happen either. The last two were planned with those ports, with one even being handled by iOS Interactive, which only went nowhere. FF5 would eventually get localized by some high school students who spent a summer in 98 poking around the game's code. Yes, Final Fantasy V was one of the first games to ever be fan translated. Thankfully though, FF6 would be released in the US, only once again, because only two Final Fantasy games had been released then so far, it was called Final Fantasy III. While the numbering was indeed getting confusing, the only numbers Square were interested in were US sales figures, which were rising. Not a lot, but FF6 would sell around 450,000 copies, which was more than I can say for Dragon Quest. After the initial promotion from Nintendo Power, sales of Dragon Warrior didn't just decline, they completely collapsed. While Dragon Quest IV sold over 3.1 million copies in Japan, Dragon Warrior IV would only sell 80,000. That, with poor numbers on many other releases, Enix would straight up leave the US market for several years during which time, Square would take over. In a peaceful land, paradise.
place is threatened by an unspeakable evil, and only one person has found the power to restore perfect order. In a new action-adventure game for your Super NES comes an exciting tale, The Secret of Mana, from Square, maker of the world's greatest video games. The SNES brought on a whole new era for the RPG, and Square was front and center. And during this time, the USA became much more accepting and open to the genre. Beginning with Final Fantasy IV in 991 and Romancing Saga the next year, Square really hit their stride with releases such as Final Fantasy VI, Secret of Mana, and Chrono Trigger. And then there was Mystic Quest. We don't talk about Mystic Quest. With the power of the SNES, Square was able to craft beautifully designed sprite art, produce absolutely memorable chiptune tracks, and thanks to Mode 7, achieve some truly breathtaking moments. It was clear to anyone that Square were trying to make their games as cinematic as possible. Chrono Trigger is personally one of my favorite titles from Square on the SNES, featuring an absolute stellar cast and a story that really gets you right here. I recently played through it again, and despite being almost 25 years old, it still holds up to this day. Even as the console was starting to show its age, Square was still churning out hit titles like Trials of Mana and Romancing Saga 3. But the one that stood out the most was the collaboration with Nintendo in Super Mario RPG. See, while Square was happy with the way their games were selling in the US, Nintendo felt they could sell more, and Miyamoto wanted to see Mario in RPG. The game would end up selling 2.14 million copies, with over 500,000 of those in the US. On the outside, it always looked like Nintendo and Square were the best of partners, and would always be together. But, the truth is, it was all a lie. It was all a facade. 